everyone. Um, welcome to Amsterdam, um, and welcome to exploring the testing hyperparameter with Kotlin and HU4K. Uh, my name is David Denton, and this is Ivan Sanchez. Um, together, we created um, HU4K. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about testing and how we think you can like, supercharge testing efforts by uh, testing applications whilst actually doing more with less. So let's get into it. But actually, before we get into it, um, and if this thing is going to work, Fantastic. Uh, because it's 2023, uh, we decided to take the rather grandiose title of the talk and put it into an AI. Specifically, it was DALI, the uh, image generator, and this is what it came out with. Actually, more specifically, this was the least terrifying thing it came out with. DALI seems to think that we're starting a cult, um, but, and we're not starting a cult, but if you do want to trade your life savings for a t-shirt, come see us at the end. Um, but uh, let's what we're going to talk about today. Right, so today we're going to talk about testing. We're going to talk about the testing pyramid and things we think are actually incorrect about it, things we think it could be better, and how you can maybe change the way you uh, kind of test applications to do kind of more with less. A bit word about hu 4 k um, We came here in like 2018 to say, to say, hey, you can represent your server as a function. Um, since then, we're now on about, I think, a million downloads a month. People seem to really like it. Uh, we've got 70 modules. Um, version five of the app is coming out in April, so hopefully very, very soon. We're adding Loom support and some of the stuff you're going to see today as well. So hopefully that's going to excite people. Um, and I'm just going to hand over to Yvonne. Yvonne. Yeah. So as we expect, we need to start talking about the testing pyramid. Uh, we imagine most of you have seen this picture before, but the summary is we expect that if you're following the testing pyramid, you're going to have some unit tests at the bottom. We expect to have loads of those that are fast, small tests that cover small bits of your application. And as you go up in the pyramid, you expect to have fewer tests that will be potentially running slower. Uh, they deal with a more uh, coverage of your system and they potentially harder to test. So there is some debate about how many of each kind of tests you should write. Uh, most people agree that you should have more unit tests. Uh, some people think that you should have more or less end-to-end -end tests. Um, we don't particularly care about this the same way that we don't care necessarily for this talk about the particular definition of each of those. Uh, we are not here to define exactly what is a unit test, what exactly is a component test. Uh, we're basically going to show our approach for that. But there's also much discussion about the fact that when you move up in the pyramid, we expect people to learn different techniques to write those tests and potentially use different libraries. So that makes them hard to test in general. We also accept that they are going to be slower and they're going to fail more often uh, because they're covering more things. And that's the part that we mainly disagree. We don't think it needs to be this way. Uh, we believe that it can be a bit more like this, um, where you can have a different dimension for the tests, uh, where you're going to have uh, more consistent, reusable code that can work across multiple layers of the pyramid. And we also believe that if you write your tests and your application like this, you can also answer more questions about how your application works, not necessarily just does it work or not. And finally, we think that by having these different layers for testing, you can choose and you can have more control about how much of the test, how much of the system you want to cover, and you can dial that to the different um, things that you want to test at any point. And we believe that will make for better tests. Um, but to talk about better tests, first we need to define what are good tests anyway. So we think there are some properties of tests that are desirable that we need to be aware of, and we need to pull as we write and design our applications. And when we think about unit tests, some of these properties are, we believe that unit tests tend to be very fast. We believe that they run in a deterministic fashion. Uh, we think that they are relatively easy to write. Uh, but we know that they're not going to cover much of our system. And that's where end-to-end -end tests, they have different properties. Some of them are desirable. We know end-to-end -end tests will cover a lot of our infrastructure. You will cover how multiple systems talk to each other and so on. Uh, but we also know that part of the properties that are undesirable is the fact that they're slow, they fail, uh, sometimes they're not deterministic. So we want to figure out how we can bring more of those desirable properties of the tests uh, in the way we design our applications and your, our tests. 
So for that, we need to figure out what are the things that make it hard to test? What are the challenges? What are the barriers to write those, goods, those good tests? And we identify some of them that we want to point out. And a lot of that people have seen the fact that when you're writing tests and when you're writing applications, sometimes uh, how many people here have seen you have a thread dot slip in the middle of the test? Many people have seen that. That's something that's not desirable. But the way we write our tests and the way we design our applications sometimes forces us to write that. And we think that's not the way to go. We need to control time uh, in order to have more of these desirable properties of tests uh, as we go. Same thing with randomness. We can't, like, it, it makes life way harder if every time you run the test, you're going to get different data, like different IDs and so on. Uh, the same thing with concurrency. Uh, if our business logic depends on the order that things happen, and we don't control this order, we're going to have trouble. And this makes life harder as you try to write more tests that deal with multiple applications that have um, concurrency characteristics. Um, similarly, with network, we know networking will be one of the main factors that will make tests slower. So again, if we're talking about unit tests being fast, uh, by default, we have to have cons concerns about not putting network in the mix or even reading from the file system. Uh, and finally, uh, we don't want to have to worry about the state of the application in the sense of we want tests to be deterministic. You can run multiple times. Don't worry about trash data. Don't worry about putting things um, in a particular state uh, in order to run these tests uh, in parallel, for example. And so as part of this talk, we want to show how we can control all these uh, variables and try to build the tests uh, in the fashion that we descri described earlier. For that, we're going to use an example application. We try to define something that is as close to real life as possible. It's actually the design is very similar to things that we've been applying to our clients. Uh, and we're going to use the example of e-commerce website. So here we have the C4 diagram for it. Uh, and you have specific components. You can think this as a normal microservice uh, infrastructure deployed to Kubernetes, and you have a whole bunch of components. So I'm going to go through what those are. So first, we have our services. These are the things that we write, the things that we control. These are the main things where uh, our business logic will be defined. And for example, we have the API gateway. We have the shop, which will be the main orchestrator for uh, our business logic. We're going to have some image server. Uh, it deals with some warehouse backed by a database where we know where our inventory is. Pretty straightforward. Uh, we also going to count on some cloud services. When we have an image server, we're probably going to store the actual physical bytes in Amazon S3. Uh, the same thing for the shop. When you make a purchase and you want to send an email, we're going to use Amazon SES. Uh, and so on. Next, we have some services that are not necessarily maintained by our team. They are maintained by either some other team in the organization or some other third party uh, provider, like an event stream where you're going to pump some events of what things are happening in the system, or a department store. Let's say you have an integration and you're going to have users on the other side uh, that need to be notified about things happening on our website. And finally, at the top, we have a customer. This is the main actor of our system. Uh, for this example, we're going to deal with two ma main use cases. One is when you want to list items to purchase, how you can get them from the system, and how you can place an order for them. And to talk about how we're going to structure application, and how we're going to build it so we can provide the test characteristics that we want, Dave's going to show some of those techniques. OK, right, yeah. So this is going to be a set of techniques that we use in order to make this easier. So this is going to be a bit of a kind of distraction, but all these kind of techniques come into kind of play when we're building these applications in a particular way. So um, one of the things that uh, the techniques that we use most is hexagonal design. Uh, if you don't know what it is, hexagonal design effectively is a way of you know, kind of enforcing a layered approach to constructing applications. Um, the thing in the middle, which we call a hub, but that's like non-hexagonal plants, contains your domain layer. The, your effectively all your business logic sits inside the hub and it doesn't know anything about infrastructure, it doesn't know anything about databases, it doesn't know about networking, it doesn't know about anything. This makes it really, really trivial to test. It knows about the abstractions that your business has got, 
but it doesn't know about actually any of the actual impl implementations. The abstractions that get injected into the domain are effectively uh, what we call ports, and those are represented by the, um, uh, by the pink kind of layer around the outside. The ports generally uh, are kind of implementations or the adapter. You can think about them as being data flowing in and out of your, of your kind of domain kind of hub in the middle. So it might be writing to the database, it might be reading from an API, it might be a UI, it could be logging, et cetera. So, but the main thing is that we, we know it's really easy to test the, the domain layer uh, in a unit testable way, but what we actually want to do is actually kind of get those, those properties and actually extract it out so we're actually testing around the outside and still retain the properties of the unit test. On to server as a function. So server as a function isn't actually related to hexagonal design, but actually it's something that uh, kind of dovetails really neatly into it. Um, so the actual idea, we came in 2018 and talked about server as a function. Um, the general idea is that a paper came out of Twitter in 2013 and said that you could represent your systems as a couple of different types of function. The one we kind of concentrate on today is called service. Um, and generally the idea is that when, if we relate it to hexagons, you can see that when you've got two ports, an outgoing port and an incoming port, and the signatures of those two things match, it means that actually you can, when I say match, I mean that the types are exactly the same, then you can plug one thing into the other without like a transport. So you can imagine uh, that being a protocol or you know, a remote thing. And that means you can pose all these services together and that makes it actually really, really unit testable. You can test the entire thing as a, fun as a kind of like one unit in a unit testable way and we're going to see how that works. How does HPFK sit in? Uh, HPFK is an implementation of server as a function, but actually whereas server as a function is protocol agnostic, HPFK only deals with HTTP, which is kind of, work, kind of fine because loads of stuff talks HTTP, so we find it works really well. Um, inside HTTP4K, you have effectively a type alias, and that represents our service function, which is just a request response. Um, HTTP4K adds in a load more functional stuff, like we use immutable data, so our request and response objects are immutable data classes, which makes it really, really trivial to test. And it's kind of a layered architecture where you can compose, function, compose functions together to kind of decorate uh, various types of function, and we'll, that's um, something we'll see again in a moment. So the interesting thing about, H about how HPFK works, though, is that the incoming port, which is an HTTP handler, and the outgoing port, which is an HTTP handler, they have exactly the same signature. What that means effectively is when you've got an HTTP client, you want to talk to a guy over there at some service, and he's, he's talking HTTP and you're talking HTTP, what a server as a function an HTTP allows you to do is replace what would be a, an HTTP client with the service that would actually consume that, that, um, that protocol. That means we are cutting out the entire network layer. We can run tests with no port, et cetera, et cetera, and it all runs really, really fast. One thing uh, that we also um, come across is events. So, one thing you probably don't, you do do in your applications, but you don't think of it as a specific port is observability. So what do we mean by observability? Observability is how does my app location behave? Not in a kind of functional way, but in a kind of non-functional, uh, I want to see, I want to add metrics, so I want to do telemetry, I want to do logging, right? But that is all data that's flying out of your system. So what we did was we decided in HTTP4K to actually expose and solidify and formalize that as what we're calling the observability port or events. And so instead of having implicit send this thing to this logger over here, we, we say, well, explicitly, I'm going to record this HTTP call to some event stream, and it means I can test it, and it means actually I can collate, and what we actually see later is we can take all of these events that get generated, and we can use them for really, really cool stuff. So it's itself, type alias is just, a, it's just an event, is event to a unit, that means Effectively, because whenever we see a unit, we know that something's happening, and it's effectively a kind of state change. So that kind of that tells you that's going on. So um, the last, or actually not the last, the semi-last setting I'm going to talk about is the screenplay actors. So screen, the screenplay pattern allows you to test your applications in a way, and write your tests in a way that have nothing to do with implementation. So we know that it's bad to write implementation-specific tests, because when you change the implementation, your tests are going to break. So screenplay is a way that allows you to kind of dis detach or decouple your implementation of your, of your test, for what actually is going on underneath your test with the actual behavior that you wish to prove. So we have one here, which is interface with the customer. It's the customer for our system. As Vaughn said, you can list some items, you can order some items. 
we can write our tests in terms of this customer, and we can write a customer implementation that talks to our domain layer, or we can talk a, a, a one that talks to our HTTP layer. We can talk. We can write one that, talk, that pretends to be a browser. It doesn't matter. The test remains the same. It's just the implementation underneath, and we'll see how that's implemented right now. This is. We're going to skip over the. Uh, sorry, we're going to skip over the domain uh, implementation. And go straight to the HTTP implementation because it's a bit more interesting. What we're going to see here, this is where we start to introduce code, and we're going to see that when we're creating classes, we start to introduce a consistency in how we're constructing it, not just classes, but our screen collectors and our tests and our test infrastructure. So this class, I'll highlight the bits that are interesting. Uh, when we're creating the custom, we can see we're injecting two different types of things. The first thing we're introducing are the variants. These are the things, the sources of randomness that we need to control. So if there was an ID generator as well, that had to go in at this, this point. But the clock, we know, as Ivan said, that's randomness. And the base URI, which is the thing that this HTTP customer is talking to, is also like dependent. That will depend where the actual requests go. The second thing we're we're, that we inject into here is the events. Uh, not the events, well, the events and the HTTP handler, which are the outgoing ports. Um, so th that comes into it. So we'll see that, as I said, like that, what we'll see is like that that's a consistent mechanism. And the nice thing about having a consistent mechanism is that the cognitive load of, of when you're creating infrastructure or, or, or tests or, or services is lowered because you get a same pattern re repeated again and again. And we can do this regardless of the actual scope of the test we're writing. Uh, the rest of this class isn't particularly interesting. It, there we've got the implementation of the item, of list items in order, which is just marshalling some, some stuff in and out of HTTP requests. Um, and we've got some setup. This setup is basically decorating the ports that are coming in. Uh, the most important one here is the fact that we've got, we're tagging all the events that get created by a customer with the customer service. And that, we do that in all the applications. And so when it goes out to what is the event stream, you can tell exactly which, which events came from which thing. Um, and so, yeah, so the very last test I think I want to talk about is fake adapters. Now, HTTP for K is very, very test driven. We like to think of ourselves as the most test driven web, web library in, in the world. That's probably bold claim, but we're going to stick with it. Um, and that has affected uh, the way we develop HTTP for K and the way we've used it on projects has affected how we actually test applications generally. We use a variant of TDD which is basically outside in, which means that you, you start with a wide ranging acceptance test and you narrow down the tests as you develop. And you write the test. This means that we find this means that you only actually test uh, the, the code that you actually need to test to get the coverage, and you write tests as they, as they come up, as opposed to that's kind of traditionally like London style. Um, but we actually do a variant in London style, we don't actually use mocks. What we use instead of mocks is like stateful test doubles. We find that these stateful test doubles, which are effectively just simple state machines that are kind of encoding the assumptions of our dependencies. Um, we find that they are more reusable as opposed to every mock that you have to set up in every single test, and it's just, it just can be a bit nightmare. And mocks are slow, so, but we can get into that. That's a different talk. Uh, this is the implementation of the fake warehouse. So our warehouse, when we're testing our shop, that talks to the warehouse, and we're going to inject a fake warehouse into our, into, into our shop. Uh, we're recreating the API of the, of, of the warehouse, the remote warehouse contract. Um, once again, we've got some stuff that takes some, takes some data out of the request, puts it out in response. It's not particularly important. But what's important really more is the stock levels is this thing is effectively just like an in-memory map with an HTTP interface. HTTP for K makes it really easy to build these kind of mocks. And the good thing about these mocks also, the, the, these mocks, these test doubles, the nice thing is that this thing actually is a function. It doesn't even implement any, it, this construction is a function. It doesn't, it just exposes a port. It doesn't even, it's not even a class. So, that's interesting because that once again means that you can where you would have an HTTP client that you were talking to um, uh, the warehouse, you can ingest check this guy instead, and the the test just does not make a difference. The last thing we can do with these with these fakes is um, I don't know if you well is to start them up on a port because the server as a function mechanism in HTTPK it, it kind of takes the runtime and it splits it out from the from the actual functionality. It means that we can actually take off fake and start it on server. This means you can deploy it into, a, an, app, into an environment. So it means that if you are reliant on some test service, which is in staging and some vendor, and it goes down every time because they don't be bothered to actually make it work properly, you can just deploy this guy instead. And it's going to be basically, you'll get a much, much cleaner and much more kind of sane CI pipeline or you know, test environments because you're controlling it. It's all deterministic. So 
Yvonne's now going to talk about how we're going to use this stuff. Yes. So based on all these techniques, we can actually put together what would be one of the services that we showed at the beginning for the e-commerce website. So we're going to get the shop API. And as you can see, it looks very similar to the um, actor that we showed before, because even the actor, we can think of that as an hexagon it's itself. So the shop API will have the variants that we need to in introduce there, so we can control things like the environment. The environment you can think of as, uh, is just a type safe map for all sense of purpose. The clock as well, so any use of the clock inside the service is controlled. For testing, you can have a test clock. In the real thing, you're going to have a real clock. Uh, and you have the adapters, like we mentioned before, one for the events, so we know that we can emit events within this AP shop API. And we have an HTTP handler that we're going to use to talk to other services. Like Dave mentioned before, uh, one thing we tend to do with those adapters, we, we try to decorate them. And the app events is the same thing that we showed before, that all the events that are generated within the shop API need to be tagged as these are orig originated from the shop, and that's what we do in the first line. In the same way, in the second line, we have an outgoing uh, HTTP um, wrapper there that tells that any request that we do into any other service, we're also going to record an event for it, and we can do interesting things with that. We also have the shop, so you can see the shop function there is our main domain, is the center of the hexagon, that inside that class there's no knowledge of any infrastructure, but it does have uh, the adapters that it requires for it to work. So in order to have a shop, we need to, pro we need to provide, we need to inject what are the events, uh, interface, what is the connection to a warehouse, and what is the adapter we're going to use to send emails. And that creates a shop for us. And finally, in order to have an API, we need to create some endpoints. And this is what we have place order, list all items. All these functions are doing is taking HTTP requests, translating to objects that you can send to the shop, get it back, put it back on the network. So it's just a translation from HTTP to domain. And we create the routes for that. And like, like outgoing HTTP requests, we also record events every time you get a request to the shop API, we can just record some events that we can use for it later. And the expose the shop API becomes just yet another HTTP handler function that we can use for tests if you provide the right dependencies, or you can just do shop API as server start, and you have your server that can run in, in production. With this server, we can now show how we can test this. We showed before that we want to write our tests using the domain language, and that's why we start with scenarios. We try to define very small, well-focused scenarios for business logic from the customer point of view. So in this case, a basic scenario is how we list items. And the test is just a one-liner saying that we expect that when the customer lists an item, it will get a list of items that will contain uh, that one item that we know about from our test data. And this interface, the same way we showed before, you can implement it just talking to the domain language, or you can use uh, more um, coverage there and test against the whole service. But we're trying to achieve that not by deploying something somewhere. We want to run against the server uh, with the same characteristics of a unit test, running all in memory with no dependencies, no network, no randomness. And that's what we're doing at the bottom there. So the shop API test requires you to create an actual shop API. So the thing we showed in the previous slide, we create one with the test environment, with the test clock, with some event interface that I'm going to mention in a bit, and the fake warehouse. So the fake that we showed before, we just inject that uh, in the place of the client. So there's no connection to an external service. We're providing the function that represents a warehouse, and we use that in our shop API. And the customer at the bottom, is the same customer actor that we showed before. In the same way, you use some test variants, like the test clock, the events, uh, and the HTTP as the shop API. And finally, we have a special uh, super class there, the record traces one, which is our implementation for tests for the events adapter, for the observability port that we mentioned before. And this is a particular one that will run as a tracer bullet one. And what it means is that it will, it's part of a JUnit extension 
But what it really matters there is that it will take all the events that are triggered on the HTTP requests and even connections to the database, whatever happens inside the service, and we'll create a dependency graph of those events, and you can use that for anything you want. In this case, it's going to use to generate sequence and interaction diagrams and save them in the file system. And they look a bit like this. So by having the events that are recorded in the system, we can actually generate documentation for free. In this case, the sequence diagrams that tell how from a customer making a request to our system, it translates to invoking something in the shop, and the shop will make a request to the warehouse, it returns the 200 and so on. And you have also, just based on that scenario, you have the snippet of what the architecture to provide that functionality looks like. And that's what, um, and that's what you see as this snippet of a C4 diagram. And that's how we normally create and test a single service. But things will start to get interesting when we talk about how you test multiple services. So we have the building blocks to test a single service, but now we can zoom out and see how we can use those building blocks that we have so far and connect them to create tests that will cover a whole system, not just uh, a single service. And that's what Dave's going to show to us next. Cool. OK, thanks. OK, so um, we're going to, as Yvonne said, we're going to kind of zoom out. And so we did have server as a function. Now we've got system as a function. So um, the composed services themselves, uh, when we take those three services, you can see the little diagram on the right. When we actually uh, compose them together, they actually just form another hexagon, exactly the same way that hexagon has incoming outgoing ports and it's got variants. And what this is an implementation of one of those hexagons. We're, what we've got here is basically testing our entire, all of the little things that we control or it, uh, booted up and actually created in this. So let's go through the code. Once again, exactly the same thing. We're injecting the variants and we're injecting the, the ports. Exactly the same thing. We're creating the network access is an interesting thing. So it's, uh, it's, uh, the network access can uh, basically gives you uh, sorry, internal HTTP routing layer because uh, it kind of simulates the network. It's about two lines of code. It's actually nothing, nothing particularly interesting. Uh, but what it's doing here, the reverse proxy routing in the middle is actually saying, when I get a request, because network access is an HTTP handler and it's a client, it says, when I get a request to the API gateway URL, go to the API gateway and so on so and so forth for the shop and the warehouse. And if you can't find anything then, go to the internet. So it's basically just routing the traffic through. So once we've got that, we can use it to basically create the API gateway for the app shop and the warehouse. Once again, these are, the, these are our individual kind of services, and we're using exactly the same mechanic as we did before. You're injecting the variants and the, and the, the, variants and the ports. It's exactly the same mechanism as before. And on the, on the warehouse, we've got an extra one, which is the in-memory uh, database, effectively, which is our other port we need. It itself, this entire thing, is also an HTTP handler. So on, in the diagram, it's just a port. So it can be, this e-commerce system can be used in place of a Java HTTP client or any other HTTP client in a bigger set system. So we're kind of seeing again and again the same patterns being used. It doesn't matter what you're testing, an endpoint or you're testing a service or you're testing multiple services together. You can use exactly the same techniques. The cognitive overload of having to change uh, or kind of create all this infrastructure is much, much reduced. So, and because we did it with the internal stuff, let's do it with the external stuff as well. So this is the internet as a function. So we did it for the other hexagon we've got is basically all the stuff we don't control. So in this case, it's the department store, the S SES and the S3. So exactly the same thing as before. We're composing all those things together. We're providing some routing. And actually, then we're just exposing an HTTP handler at the outside. So you can see here, we've got the department store, the fake SES and the fake S3. Those two last ones come from the HVK Connect library. Uh, the HVK Connect library is like a low, uh, zero reflection client to various cloud services. There's quite a lot of um, a, uh, AWS adapters in there. But these services, the S3, and we also provide a load of fakes. The fakes are doing exactly the same as the fake warehouse. They provide the API of S3, they provide the of SES, and they allow you to do complete in-memory testing without talking to an actual local stack or Docker. You know, with the, all this stuff is happening, it's all happening in memory. So that means there's no networking. It's all going to be razor sharp and fast. Uh, yeah, the reverse proxy routing, same thing as before. Nothing particularly interesting. And we are also implementing and exposing the HTTP handler. Once again, the internet can be used as a Java in the place of a Java HTTP client because it's just a port or an adapter. And 
we can go even further. So why stop there? So you know, we can, once we've got our, our individual services and we can pose them into our own external, and then we've got our external services and we can pose them into our external hexagon, let's make another hexagon, right? Why not? Let's, let's just keep going. So this, is, uh, this pattern, we're not going to show you exactly how it's implemented, but it's the same pattern. It's just going to be boring to look at because it's the same thing again. Um, it's just going to be taking those hexagons and injecting the variants and the ports, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing, the real power of this particular, this particular pattern, though, is that you can actually run your entire infrastructure, internal external services, on a single JVM with a couple hundred meg of, data, of, of, of memory, and it just runs locally. Now, we've seen this work really well. It means you can test your entire infrastructure locally, so you're shifting all that testing left. There's no more kind of, as long as we're assume, we can prove that our services and our, our fakes can talk in exactly the same language, and that's contract test, C 2018, we can actually start up an entire application environment on our own boxes. Now, what we've seen is mobile developers use this because mobile developers usually, and UI developers, they always, you know, they're talking to staging and then somebody's deploying over the top of their changes and it doesn't work and it's all undeterministic. Every UI and mobile developer can have their own version of the entire system running on their box in one JVM with actually, you know, and it's completely deterministic. It's a real game changer for actually, for their productivity. So how would we test the universe? So this is, there's a lot of code here, don't worry, I'm going to take you through it, but um, it's effectively the same, uh, just a wider scale of what we saw before. We've got a test class, a test class at the bottom, so let's, let, oh, stop even. let's start with that scenario. So this is the customer buys item scenario. Um, once again, the, in this uh, scenario, we've got a wider scale thing. The guy, the guy logs in, he, he lifts an item, he can like check, he can see it and then he buys it, and then they, he gets an email, and the, the, the store receives uh, an order, effectively. And we're testing exactly that functionality using exactly the same technology or same techniques that we were doing before. So we've, we're talking, the test is entirely, entirely written, it's tested interface, and it's entirely written without knowledge of actually the underlying implementation. We've introduced another, um, Another actor, and then the website customer is actually just an extension of the, of the shop customer, so we can completely reuse the code. It's just done by delegation. So once again, we're, kind of, we, we're writing test infrastructure can be used to test individual endpoints or individual services or the entire system by reusing all the code using exactly the same techniques. At the bottom, we have the universe tests, where, which effectively can implement many, many scenarios, um, if you want. Um, we're creating our internet and then we're populating the internet. That population, that cloud cloud resources is creating some buckets and it creates some email accounts in the fake S3 and in the fake, you know, in the fake SQF, um, fake uh, SES, because those things need to exist because the fakes demand that those things exist. And if you try and send an email to a thing that doesn't exist, it's gonna know what you're talking about. Um, and so then we populate the environment, we're setting up our, uh, we're setting up our test clock as well. Those are our variants. And then how do we create our e-commerce system? Well, we do exactly the same things as before. We inject the variants into the thing, we inject the ports into the thing, and we get out a system. The system is an HTTP handler, which means we can inject it in place of the HTTP client into our website customer. All this again, running in memory completely, uh, and th this will test the entire setup front to back in the same time it takes to run a unit test. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice we've still got the record traces. So, once again, we're going to reuse the record traces. And what actually is going to happen is that instead of just recording traces for the individual service, we're going to actually record in traces for all the services together, which is going to end up with this. This is basically, we have no more code, and this is completely generated from that test. So all of the, all of the tests, by just extending that class, are going to generate this entire diagram. You can see exactly what's going on. You're getting uh, complete visual feedback about the traffic that went back and forth between the two things. You can see exactly the systems that were involved. You can write different renders that will tell you how many times you went into the database. What was the, uh, what was the front to back kind of maximum hop depth? There are lots and lots of different things. It's, and it's not limited to HTTP. It's lim you can see the database calls in there as well. These are the event stream calls in there as well. So it's just, uh, you just need to implement the events and like set it up correctly and you automatically get all this stuff for free. Now, we managed to do an end-to-end -end test that effectively uh, runs deterministically and it's fast and it's stable. Now, what the other thing that we, people didn't like about end-to-end -end tests is that when they're flaking, they go wrong, right? When, oh, like, what happened? Where, you know, where did it go wrong? Oh, I'm gonna have to go and dig through some Kibana traces to find out where I, why it failed. 
You don't have to do that with this. So let's say, for example, the department store decides to blow up during the middle of our test. Well, well the test doesn't care that the actual, the, that the actual uh, department store blew up. Well, it's going to fail. But after it fails, the test extension will generate the trace diagram anyway. And we're going to get this. So when the test fails, the, the te tracer goes, hey, the test failed, but here's the diagram for exactly what happened. And so you get a visual representation of exactly what happened in the test. You know exactly where it blew up. You know exactly the traffic that happened. Let's see. And so once again, this is all basically for free by using exactly the same infrastructure as we already pre previously used. Uh, now, Yvonne's going to talk about, so that's all great, but then Yvonne's going to talk about other things that we do to make all this stuff possible. Yeah. Well. So a lot of that you get for free, but it, there are some practices that we find that help out when you're building applications in this style. And some of them are not uh, very um, well adopted or very familiar to people, so we decided to describe a bit what are the things that we tend to do that help out when you're building applications like this. First one is we use monorepos most of the time. Uh, monorepos make way easier for us if you want to have a single JVM for the whole system for all the services, it's much easier, let's say, that all the services are part of a single Gradle project and single repository. Uh, it does save a lot of time in orchestrating all these different dependencies. It doesn't mean, it, it means that we don't have to publish libraries, consume libraries. It also means that we can easily create all this test infrastructure and share it across different uh, services and different teams if they are all working on the same monorepo. There are trade-offs there. We know that when you work in monorepo, you also have to be mindful that services will get deployed at different times, and for that you need some contract testing, compatibility tests, and so on, and we train to do that as well. We're not going to cover in this talk, but we know it's important. But we find that monorepo, all in all, uh, help us quite a lot to achieve this kind of design. We also, like Dave mentioned, we try to use TDD for this. We can't think how a team can achieve this level of design if they try to feed back an existing system and try to work backwards to create this level of testing. So we find that by using this outside in, we define what the customer needs to do, work our way in, define the fakes when we have external dependencies and create those end-to-end -end tests uh, all in memory helps quite a lot. Next, we have the contract testing. Like we mentioned before, we need some assurance that our assumptions about the third-party services that we're creating fakes for uh, are correct, that they behave more or less like the real thing. So we described that in the previous talk. You can check it out. Uh, but there are ways to, to work around that and make sure that the implementation um, are reliable, basically. And as a final step, we found that to achieve this kind of design, we have to make a lot of small decisions. And we find that it's very important to record those decisions. And we use architecture decision records to, this, to document not only what are these small things that we decide to do, but why we're doing them. And it's quite important to share the knowledge amongst all the teams, but also becomes a learning uh, tool for people coming into the project. And by doing all that, uh, what do we gain at the end? Like Dave mentioned, this, the main benefit of this approach, we find that we are shifting left our testing and our observability. It means that a lot of the things that people would normally do just on staging or pre-production environments, we can now do on the developer machine. The same thing for uh, not only if you're designing those services, but like Dave mentioned, if you're a front-end developer, a mobile developer, the ability to have the whole system, the whole backend running on the same machine and you're playing around and seeing those diagrams, we find to be very, very powerful. And by creating those different dimensions in the testing pyramid, using the same abstractions, uh, we find that people don't have to learn different ways to do testing at different levels. We're reusing the infrastructure, people are having just the same abstractions that ca they can use to test a single service, a whole system, multiple system, third-party integrations, and so on. And this is all running like unit tests. All the desirable properties that we described at the beginning, both from unit tests and end-to-end -end tests, we try to combine them together, and we, we see that we can achieve that. And um, finally, we have documentation. As we showed before, um, all those diagrams come back for free the way we're running this. And 
we can also answer all sorts of questions. If you want to figure out the size of the payloads that we're sending across the system, these are all can be recorded in the events, and we can inspect that uh, as we're running our tests. And if you want to have a go at this, we suggest you check HP4K. Uh, we are about to release version 5, so everything you've seen so far in this talk is already available since version 1. It's over six years old, server as a function, that type alias is the same since the beginning. You can do all that, the events interface, everything's in there. The only thing that we're going to make available now in version 5 is all the diagramming things that you saw here bef um, during this talk. They are part of the incubator project there, so you can take a look, but we're going to release as um, part of version 5. Uh, we also not only looking at the developer experience testability side of, of H4K, but we're also looking at the runtime. Uh, we didn't cover a lot of how you can run this, how does that look in production, um, but Dave and I were looking before trying to count how many different ways you can run a server as a function, uh, and we counted 20. 20. Right? We have 20 different backends that you can choose from, from Undertow, from Lambda, uh, WebSocket, Growl, you name it, uh, and we're also going to introduced three new ones with Loom for version 5. Uh, have I missed anything? I don't think so. Um, the only thing we did add recently was um, we added an OpenAI Connect module. So if you want to check out OpenAI, then uh, we jump on the bandwagon. Uh. Yes. Uh, and that's all we have for today. Uh, we're really curious to hear from people what they think about this approach, uh, how that will look in your scenario. Um, and that's it for us. Thank you very much. I've um, probably got a couple of minutes for questions, if, if anyone's got any questions. Yes. Oh, there's also the link for all the code that we showed. Oh, yeah. So the, uh, it's going to be there. Uh, in what way do you mean using for testing? In terms of like... Uh, Uh, so there are, there's, there are, we don't actually do any kind of validation. We just do the generation of the open API stuff. But you can, there are tools available to kind of do that kind of, kind of contract testing. I suppose it's quite, it's quite an involved open API is quite an involved spec. Um, but you, it's quite really good if you start doing a lot of fuzzing and stuff, sort of fuzz testing. It's like really, really powerful technique to kind of. Yeah. Uh, so, so the question was if we, if we can use the open API as part of this. Uh, as we're exposing everything as an HTTP handler, uh, within your HTTP handler, you can use contracts for everything. It's just uh, transparent. You can still do everything that we've done here using um, the contracts. Uh, the contract, the AP open API itself, doesn't give anything extra. It doesn't do any validation because the, the, the specification is actually driven from the runtime anyway. So it's generated from the runtime as opposed to being a static specification that you have to reverse engineer into code. Yes, I think we have time for one more. Uh, are you using standard Gradle or you're using Basil or something? Uh, we are using Gradle for most of the projects that we work on. Uh, we find that it works fine for dozens of services, plus all the infrastructure, all the testing thing. Like we never run into a particular barrier running that. Um, sometimes we use Gradle Cache. But even that is just optimization. We find that a regular developer machine nowadays can run a monorepo for dozens of, of microservices just fine, uh, as long as you manage to keep Gradle simple. Uh, don't go too crazy. Okay. Anything else? I think we're done. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great